Well, the blokes at coffee this morning could not believe that stories like this were in the Bible. Uh, I will adjust the language because the children are present. But here we go. Today we come to chapters 17 to 21, the last chapters of Judges. They're relevant, they're contemporary, and they're gory. I remind you that historic narrative is descriptive. It tells you what happened rather than being prescriptive, telling you what should happen in an ongoing way in the future. If you sideline revelation, you sideline God, and the result will be chaos. If you sideline revelation, you sideline God, and the result will be chaos. Judges chapter 17. Micah is from the tribe of Ephraim. He still steals 1,100 pieces of silver from his own mum. And when he overhears her curse the thief, he returns the silver to her and confesses his crime. She blesses him and gives him 200 pieces of silver to take to the silversmith so that the silversmith can fashion an image or an idol to add to his household gods in the domestic shrine. You see, Micah is very religious. He's even ordained his own son as his priest. And then along comes a real priest, a man from the tribe of Levi. That's the priestly tribe. He's a grandson of Moses. His name is Jonathan. Micah now employs him to be his priest. And Micah says, now God will be good to me. Spies from the tribe of Dan, who haven't been able to settle land from chapter one, come looking for land, and five of them stop at Micah's home. They recognise the Levitical priest and they ask him, will our journey be successful? He says, it's under the eye of God. They find a beautiful valley, Laish. It is inhabited by peaceful people without allies, and they think that will be an ideal place for the tribe of Dan. They return with 600 heavily armed men. They come to Micah's house where they had enjoyed hospitality. They take his gods, they take his shrine, they take his priest. And Micah protests and they say, you be very careful because these men can get angry. Might is right. They go on to Laish, they destroy the community there, they claim Laish as their own, and they call it the land of Dan. They set up their gods, they set up their priest, and that's the tribe of Dan. Now friends, that's the covenant people of God. That's the people of Israel. Micah from the tribe of Ephraim, the spies and the 600 from the tribe of Dan. They've got Moses, grandson there, they should know the law, and yet the first law, you shall have no other gods before me, forget that. Don't make any graven images. The second law, forget that. Honour your father and mother, forget that. You shall not murder, forget that. You shall not steal, forget that. You shall not covet, forget that. And yet they had all the religious trappings. Have a look at chapter 18, verse 31. And we are told there that the house of God was in Shiloh, and yet Micah had set up his own shrine for himself. Hard to be sorry for Micah, isn't it? I mean, he's a man who steals from his own mum. It's hard to be sorry for the mum. She uses a lot of the silver for idols. It's hard to be sorry for the priest. He goes where the best offer is. And it's hard to be sorry for the Danites. They're thieving, murdering bullies. Might is right. Now, anxiety occurs when behaviour becomes unpredictable. Hospitality backfires. A friend, even your own son, becomes an enemy and superstition displaces truth. If you sideline revelation, you sideline God, and the result will be chaos. Now underline, because each week we've been underlining a book in the church, a, a line in the church Bible, chapter 17, verse six is your underlining verse. In those days, 17, six, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Illustration two. If you were watching this on Netflix, you'd wonder whether you should. You'd certainly send the kids to bed. I've adjusted the language. No one in these chapters, 19, 20, and 21, is named. 
because they're acting like animals. A Levite, a priest, has a concubine, a live-in companion. They fall out together and she goes back to her dad. The Levite invites her back with kind words and her father is pleased to see them and wants to keep them at his place, but the Levite wants to go back to Ephraim. They try to get away one day, two days, three days, four days, and finally they get away on the fifth day. The Levite, his living companion, a servant and a donkey, find their way to Jebus, the city of Jerusalem, but now under Canaanite control, and the Levite says, this isn't safe. So they go on to Gibeah because it is in the land of Benjamin. They'll be safer there and they come to the city square and an old man sees them and says, it's not safe here, you come home with me. And we are told some wicked men from the city, some worthless fellows come to the house and this is what they say, bring out the man who came to you so we can have relations with him. They are even more graphic. But here we are in Judges chapter 19, verse 22, bring out the man so that we can have relations with him. And it reminds you, yes, you've seen these words exactly before. Not in Judges 19, but in Genesis 19, where Lot is surrounded by the men of Sodom. Bring out the men who are staying with you so that we might have relations with them. But the tragic difference, friends, is that in Genesis 19, it's Sodom, the pagans. Judges 19, it's the people of Benjamin. It is the covenant people of God. And the Levite sends out his companion. We read that she's abused all night, and it's a very vivid narrative, which you can read later. But incredibly, he goes to bed, and he goes to sleep. And when he wakes up in the morning, he opens the door and there she is, his companion, lying on the doorstep. And she says, look at the verse 28, it's brilliant storytelling. She sa- he says, get up, let's go. Well, she's dead. And he takes her and he lies her across his donkey. He takes the body home with his servant and the donkey and he dismembers her. Twelve pieces, one piece each to the tribe of Israel. And the people of God are horrified. Chapter 20. The leaders of Israel now step in. They convene a national assembly. The Levite tells what happens and he puts himself in a very good light. You read it later. And they call on Benjamin to repent and give up these wicked men. The people of Benjamin don't. They harbour these wicked, worthless fellows. And so civil war breaks out and day one, Benjamin prevails. Day two, Benjamin prevails. And on day three, God says, I will give them today into your hand. And Benjamin's wiped out. All but 600 men. And the leaders of Israel can't have a tribe of Israel. You can't have 11 tribes. You must have 12 And we read that they make two vows. First, that no people in Israel will give their daughter to the sons of Benjamin. So you've got a problem. They've got to have some daughters. They've got to have some females. And the second vow, anyone who did not come to the National Assembly will be put to death. And it just so happens that the people of Jabesh Gilead from the tribe of Manasseh, Gad and Reuben had not come and they were put to death. Israelites by Israel. And 400 of their young maidens were kept for the men of Benjamin. But they're still 200 short. What shall we do? Oh, well, the leaders say there's a religious festival in which Yahweh is being worshipped in Shiloh. Young ladies will come out dancing. So you 200 Benjamites, you stay in the bushes. And when they come out dancing, go in and take, kidnap one for each of you. And when their fathers and brothers come to us, they'll say, you're not guilty. You haven't given those, your daughters, to them. They've kidnapped them, so don't complain and accept it. What you're seeing here, dear friends, is abuse, gang abuse, defended. Foolish vows made. Civil war, slaughter of thousands, kidnapping, disregard for the emotional ties of kinship, all of it generated by the elders the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the leaders of the people of God, scheming deceitfulness. And all through this narrative, you read words like the elders said, the elders said, they said. And then you come to chapter 21, verse 25. Here's an underlined verse. 
In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Sideline revelation. And Israel had the very words of God. And you sideline God. And this leads to chaos. Well, in our family, uh, Maxine buys for birthdays. And there's lots of those in the year. So Maxine will say, right, it's somebody's birthday. Let's ring them up, wish happy birthday, and there's a present. I've got the relatively easy job. My job is Christmas. All I have to do is worry about one day and a pile of presents for that one day. And I can remember back in the 2015s when I said to the grandkids, what would you like? The whole issue of Frozen came up. Frozen DVDs, frozen T-shirts, frozen school bags, frozen bedside lamps, and they're still around. But I don't know if you know Frozen, but there's a showstopper in Frozen that's been downloaded 1.5 billion times. It's Elsa's song. Listen to it. It's time to see, she says, what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Everyone did as he saw fit. And combine that, dear friends, with the prevailing, dominating educational philosophy of the 21st century, which is called constructivism. You don't give children answers. You let them construct their own. No objectivity. You determine the answer that's right for you. In fact, if you look at the ethics classes in schools, which are an alternative to scripture, and listen to one of my favourite newsreaders, Hugh Rimmerton, on Channel 10, he teaches a, an ethics class. And ethics is the alternative to scripture. And he says this, when I'm a teacher, the teacher does not make judgments of right or wrong, but we encourage the children to reflect and to question. I don't want any ideology <laughs> in education, an ideology-free education. Surely an ideology-free education is itself an ideology. And our great hope is that reality will always trump ideology. Dear friends, there is a Christian the world loves, and you can hear it most Sunday nights on Sydney radio. People ring up and say, oh, we love your kind of Christian. You're so non-judgmental. If you're going to be tolerant of everything, and if you're going to be non-judgmental, then it means that you've got no standards. No standards of right or wrong, I'm free. If you tolerate all things, you must set aside God's revelation. And when God's revelation is sidelined, you sideline God, and the result is chaos. Maxine and I recently were in Los Angeles on a very small sample Christmas dinner. There were about 12 people there. And around New Year, we had a sort of curry night and there were about 12 people there. As I got to talk to these American people, I found that all of them came from families which were under pressure. Dysfunctional family life was there. In fact, Barbara Bush, the late First Lady of the United States said, it's not so important what happens in the White House, what's happening in your house is far more important. And I can tell you in the United States, one sociologist said he'd studied every person guilty of mass killing and with one exception, they all came from dysfunctional families. On our trip to the United Kingdom this year, we heard a BBC commentator, a very elderly conservative sociologist, and I quote him, he said, disintegration of the British family is happening in our lifetime. If you sideline revelation, you sideline God, and the result will be chaos. So dear friends, I want to say four things this morning. First, do you take seriously the priority of daily Bible reading for you and for your family? Do you take the lead with your children, teenagers, whatever they are, around the dinner table at the end of the meal and just open the word and read it and say what it might mean for today? Do you take that seriously? 
And secondly, be very careful of poor interpreting the Bible. Do you respect the Bible enough to put it in its context and don't look for justification for conspiracy theories? And thirdly, and here is the great enemy, it seems to me, of Revelation, do you search for the real word of God, the special word of God beyond the Bible so that I hear God speak here, but I want to hear him speak directly to me. So I listen for that word and that word that he gives me trumps this word. When I became a Christian, I was taught, when you pray, pray every day, you talk to God and then you are silent and you listen to God's voice. All you'll hear at that point is a hunch in the silence. What I should have been told is when you pray, talk to God every day, and then you listen to God by reading the Bible. And he speaks to you. And I put it to you. Is the privilege of God's word being respected a priority in your life so that coming to this group every Sunday doesn't become something you do unless you've got something else to do. It becomes the priority. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And having the opportunity of enrolling in a small group, is that something you'll take seriously? Because you want to see the word of God not being sidelined and you want to see chaos not resulting. An old friend of mine said that they used to have Sunday lunch after church every Sunday, big lunch on Sunday, baked dinner. And invariably they'd go home and the discussion around the table was, how did you go? How did you go at church today? What did God say to you today? How did you go? But he said, it seems to me that we've replaced this, how did you go with, how did he go? How did the preacher go today? Was he interesting? Was he engaging? How did he go? No, how did you go? How did you go as you saw the chaos here? a result of the sidelining of the word of God. Well, Yahweh, the Lord, is unconditionally committed to his people. He will work his purposes out no matter how bad they are because he persists with them in grace. Now, I want you to take your Bibles there and open them to Judges chapter 21. And when you've got them opened at Judges chapter 21, I want you to do one more thing. I want you to turn the page. And what do we find? We find the story of a widow with a Moabite daughter-in-law. And through personal tragedy, that daughter-in-law, whose name is Ruth, meets and marries a man called Boaz. And if you go over to chapter four of Ruth, verse 17, it tells you that Ruth and Boaz were the parents of Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, the shepherd king. And ultimately in this line comes great David's greatest son, the Lord Jesus. Isn't that amazing? So through all the plots and plans and the rebellion and the deceit, through every woke cause which confronts us, through this hard-hearted ruthlessness, God rules. His purposes triumph. Dear friends, if you sideline revelation, you sideline God, and the result will be chaos. But Ruth follows judges. God's purposes prevail. He will glorify himself. Well, please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you have said, this is the one I esteem, the one who is humble and who trembles at my word. We give you thanks this morning for the Bible, your breathed out clear, authoritative revelation. Empower us by your inspiring spirit to read, mark, learn and obey it. We pray that you would guide and guard preachers our preachers, guide and guard our scripture teachers, guide and guard parents, guide and guard each one of us as we teach and take this word to heart. Sovereign Lord, glorify yourself and give us a vital awareness of whose we are 
and empower us to live consistently with identity. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's name because of his merits alone. Amen.